You're listening to the Option Alpha podcast from OptionAlpha.com, where we show you how to make smarter trades, learn how the stock market really works, and generate consistent monthly income. Monthly income. Now, your host and head trader at OptionAlpha.com, Kirk Duplessis. Hey everyone, this is Kirk here again from OptionAlpha.com, working every single week to make this the most popular investing podcast offered online because it's based on one thing and one thing only, and that's helping you make smarter trades. So thanks so much again for tuning in today. We've got a really cool podcast episode. I don't even know how long this is going to take to kind of go through because what we're basically going to do here is go through a short strangle case study in EWZ. And this is basically start to finish the adjustments that we made in EWZ over a five-month period that we ended up holding this position that slashed our loss by 87%. Basically took a trade that at one point was losing about $2,500 and cut the loss down to just $330. And I think it's a really cool case study because uh, it just kind of proves the concept that we've been talking about a lot here on Option Alpha over the last year and a half. Um, a lot of different concepts that we're going to talk about here in the show. So definitely might be a little bit longer episode, but I really, really encourage you to listen the entire way through because you're going to gain a lot out of this episode, hopefully in adjusting trades. And I know that that's a big topic, a big hot button that everyone likes to talk about. Now, obviously, it's going to be really hard to do a lot of this via audio. So I'm going to do my best in going through this on the podcast here today. But if you want to see a video version of today's show, where we actually go through our account statements and show you each individual trade, the timing, the dates, everything, so you can see everything. You just want to head on over to the show notes page at optionalpha.com slash show 59. Again, we'll have a video there that you can see all the account statement stuff so you can see all the trades. I encourage you to go back and double check my work and math and everything because it's all live trades. Everything was posted live to the members area and is now subsequently live on YouTube and publicly available. So you don't even have to be a member to see kind of every single trade because every time that we do a trade, we send out a video update every single night to our pro and elite members. And so through this entire five month process, we continue to talk about this position because we held it for a long time. And so all of that content is now out there. Uh, And again, today's show is basically to bring everything back together and kind of talk through the entire case study of what happened with EWZ and how the trade started out really well and then turned really bad and how we were able to kind of salvage this trade. Now, the question that most people probably ask is like, why do I even do this, right? And I think in my opinion, I think it's really easy, but yet boring to talk about trades that went really well. It's where you learn is talking about trades that did not go well. So I doubt you'll probably hear many shows or podcasts out there where a trader comes on and all we're going to talk about is a trade that still lost me $330. But I really believe that this concept that we're going to talk about and how we adjust and the, the rationale behind it is something that could absolutely save you thousands upon thousands of dollars over your lifetime trading. And so if I have to be the guinea pig that comes out here and tells you how that ended up working out for me and I still had a trade that ended up losing money, then so be it. And so hopefully that helps out. So in today's show, like I said, we're going to talk about one particular position that we had in EWZ. Now, it's not one trade that we had in EWZ. It's a cumulative position that we started building. Now, this case study basically goes back about five months. We started building the position in EWZ back in November of 2015, then ultimately closed out everything in May of 2016. So it's a long time period that this trade actually kind of covers, but it's really important that we understand that sometimes we do have trades that go you know, really long. I think this is probably our longest trade that we've had to date, our longest position that we continuously had to manage. And that was something that was tough. I mean, as somebody who runs obviously Option Alpha and I'm always in there, you know, talking with our pro and elite members. I mean, I had to keep a lot of people cool and, you know, calm down for four and a half to five months on this trade, kind of waiting for all of this to make sense and turn around. And I'm, I'm glad it did, obviously, because it, you know, gives us a great platform here to use this as a case study. But the first position that we started building in EWZ was at the end of November in 2015. Now, let me just tell you visually where EWZ was at the time. And it's an emerging market uh, Brazil ETF, just in case you don't know what EWZ is. But the entire ETF was at the bottom of a downtrend. So it had you know, come down basically from the mid 30s and was now down trading uh, below $20, around $18 or so is where it got to the low of the actual trend. 
But as it was on its way down and it was starting to get down around $20 or so, implied volatility started to spike up. So implied volatility had previously been pretty low, but now the you know ETF was really starting to move down considerably every day. And so implied volatility spiked up to around the 80th uh, rank. And so as you know, or most of you know, if you listen to the show, that obviously was a good signal for us to start getting in and start building a position in e- and EWZ. The first two positions that we started building were January and February options because we wanted to kind of spread things out over time. And we started selling some strangles. So all we did was continuously sell some of these strangles in EWZ. So for example, we sold the 26 calls and then we sold the 19 puts and took in a $55 credit on each of those. And we did a basket of three. And then we would do another basket of three where we sold, you know, something a little bit tighter in where we sold the 24 calls and then the 18 puts. So we continuously did this kind of moving around where we were building this position in EWZ, taking in this credit as the security was moving down. Now, as we got into 2016, things actually were going pretty well. We had got into some January positions back in November, so we were trading about 45 days out, and got into some January positions, subsequently closed some of those out, took money off the table. We had got into some January strangles for $55 a piece, closed them out for $19 a piece, I got in some other ones for $48, closed those out for $24. So everything seemed to be going really, really well with our position. And during that entire time period, heading into 2016, EWZ continued to have high implied volatility. And so as it started to trade down around $18 now and then back up to around $20 in mid-January of 2013, I'm sorry, 2016, it still had really high implied volatility. And so all of that worked out really high implied volatility. The stock was basically trading in a $2 range, which was great. And so that allowed us to get into a lot of positions and then close out some of those for a profit. Now, where things really started to get crazy, and you'll see this if you head on over to the show notes page, again, optionalpha.com slash show 59, where things really started to get crazy was at the end of the February expiration cycle. So we kind of went through February started trading March. Again, March ended up working out okay. We were able to close out a couple trades for a profit. But then as we started building more positions for March and April, what happened is is at the end of the February expiration cycle, towards like the last couple days in February, EWZ basically went from $20 up to $26 in about five days. And so what we had was this huge move higher in EWZ And that really kind of threw all of our strangles out of whack. Now, remember, with the strangle, you're basically selling options out of the money on the call side and the put side. But we weren't expecting the stock to move up to $26 in a matter of literally five days. Okay, so we're talking about a huge, huge move. And during that time period, what was really tough is that implied volatility had not yet gone down. See, what most people think is they think, hey, if the market goes down, then implied volatility goes up. And if the market goes up, implied volatility goes down. But that doesn't always happen that way. You can still have high implied volatility with a stock that's rising or rallying really fast. And that's exactly what we had in the case of EWZ. Between the time that it went from $20 to $26, implied volatility actually went up from around the 70th rank up to around the 80th rank. So it actually increased during this move. So that, you know, for us as an option seller during this time period, it was like a double whammy. I mean, you had the security that moved against you and you had implied volatility that moved against you, two things that you really don't want to have happen during that time period. And so that was obviously really, really tough. Now, if you just want to understand some of our positions at the moment that were underwater, we had sold a lot of uh, 24 calls in some positions in March. We had sold some 21 calls in March. So now we're talking about positions that are now 2 to $5 underwater in our portfolio. And so obviously that's really, really tough. And again, I had to kind of you know calm a lot of people down and help try to coach and educate people through this process during this period because now we were underwater on those calls. We really couldn't move those calls. We had to leave those as is and start adjusting the opposite side of the trade. So early in March expiration, after this huge, huge move up, uh, actually, I think we actually started the last couple of days of February and then into the early part of March, what we ended up starting to do was adjusting our position. Now, this is where I think we really have to talk about 
this concept or this idea of making these adjustments to our portfolio. And one of the things that we teach here at Option Alpha and, and that we believe in is that you should adjust the side of the trade that the market is moving away from. So in this case, EWZ moved up. So we would only be touching or adjusting our puts. We would be rolling our put strikes higher and higher and higher. So theoretically, when the market moves up, those put strikes that we sold are now worth no money or little money. So we close those out, bank a little bit of a profit, and roll up to a closer put strike, which collects more premium. And that premium helps widen the break-even point on the top side of the trade. So just to give you an idea of one of these types of adjustments so we can conceptually think about it, is what we ended up doing is we ended up rolling up our March 19 puts that we had originally sold for about, let me just see here, I wanna see where those strikes are so we know exactly what it is. We originally sold those 19 strike puts for $36, And then literally three days later, when the market popped, we were able to buy those 19 strike puts back for $8. So technically, we create a little bit of a profit here, and that's all baked into the numbers that we talked about earlier. But we create a little bit of a profit, and then we resold the 22 puts for $60. Okay, so now we took in a net credit of $52 on that adjustment. So again, we bought back our 19 short puts for a profit, but then we resold the 22 puts, which are now at a higher strike price for a nice credit of $52. And again, that $52 credit helps widen the break-even point beyond our short call strikes, another 52 cents. So now we're just collecting credits that help widen out the break-even point or the call side break-even point above the market. So this concept with adjusting this trade was, again, never touch the side that the market is moving against. In fact, we never rolled our strikes up on the call side the entire time. And we'll talk about rolling them out here in a second, but we never rolled them up. We continued to maintain those short 21 calls, short 24 calls, et cetera, throughout the entire process because we know that that's just not how we adjust those trades. We don't want to close out of those positions and then basically be left with a losing trade, roll up our calls. What if the market continued to move higher? Then we just compound the loss on the call side. Now, I know this goes against a lot of what people have learned out there, a lot of what you've seen out there, but I can tell you for sure with absolute certainty now that we've started back testing uh, lots and lots of different adjustment techniques, this is the way to do it for sure. It doesn't always work in this case, right? So like it's never 100% certain, but way, way, way more often than not, making this type of adjustment strategy where you don't touch the side of the trade that the market is moving against, in this case with EWZ, that's the call side, that is the adjustment technique or overall overall philosophy that works out more often than not. And we've started back testing thousands and thousands and thousands of different ways you can do it. Uh, and that same theme continues to prevail throughout all of that back testing that we've started doing. So now here we are in this position, right? And so again, graphically now EWZ is up around $26 and implied volatility hasn't really dropped. In fact, it's gone up. Now what do we do? Now we're running to uh, the March expiration cycle. We So we started building all these March positions. Now a lot of them are underwater. What do we do in this case? Now this is really where you have to have I think two things that worked really well in our favor, not worked well in our favor, but that we had in our back pocket that kind of allowed us to do this next step. And the first thing that really was critical in us being able to maintain this position and ultimately turn it around was that as we were nearing March expiration, we hadn't added to the position after it went against us. So we had maintained that small position. It was manageable. It was reasonable. I could take care of the position. It wasn't going to blow up our portfolio. And so having that ability as we got to March expiration gave us a lot of freedom to say, hey, we can hold this position a little bit longer if we need to, right? We don't need to close it out because we don't need the capital. So maintaining that small position allowed us the flexibility to even consider the next thing, which is rolling the contracts out, which we'll talk about here in a second. The other thing that we had that was really kind of in our back pocket here was that it was an an ETF. Now, I wouldn't say that we would have necessarily continued to do this strategy the entire time with a stock because with a regular stock, you do have a lot of risk that the stock just makes a huge move higher and stays there, right? Uh, Or a huge move higher from a buyout or merger or something like that, or they get acquired, whatever the case is. So that risk is obviously prevalent in stocks. With 
ETFs, you have much, much less risk that you're going to have a huge, huge move higher, you know, just randomly this uh, binary event that just the stock jumps, you know, 18% in one day. So we knew that there was going to be a little bit of market cyclicality in EWZ, meaning that at some point, EWZ was going to normalize and come back down. People were going to take money off the table. Stocks don't go directionally one way forever. There's got to be an ebb and a flow to a market. Now, call it whatever you want, market efficiency, market neutrality. We've talked about it on previous shows. We know that it's pot, that it's there. It's been back-tested. The data definitely suggests that markets are efficient. They don't move in one direction all the time for a long, sustained period. So we knew if we could hold the position long enough that we would have an opportunity to take some of the trade off and reduce our risk. And really for me, it comes down to not taking what the market forces upon me. So the market forced a really bad move on me, but because I had a small position, I was able to hold through that and realize that at some point, the person who's more patient that can hold through that position, that initial Uh, inertia or that initial move that created the big loss on paper, if I could hold through that, then I would be okay. Okay. So two things that worked out really well, or we kind of had in our back pocket, whatever you want to call it, our position size was small. We never added to it after it started moving against us. And then after that, we obviously were trading an ETF, which means that we had a lot more flexibility and we didn't have to worry about some sort of binary event that might happen in the future. So again, as we started nearing closer to March expiration, we had to start making some decisions about what we were going to do. Now, all the way through March, as the stock was actually rallying up higher and higher and higher, because as we got to the end of March expiration, the stock had rallied up to around $27. As we got closer and closer to March expiration, we continued the entire time to roll up our put strikes across the board. So again, you can see this on the show notes page at optionalpha.com slash show 59, but we started rolling our 17 puts up to 24 and then our 19 puts up to 24. And then we started rolling our 19 puts to 26. And like we just continued to roll up and up and up. And the entire time that we did that, we kept taking in a credit. Now that's another major theme here that I want to hit on is that if you're going to make adjustments to a position, you've got to get compensated for taking that or making that adjustment. In my opinion, when you're dealing with these straddles and strangles, You've got to continue to take in a credit because the entire time we kept taking in this big, big credit, 45 cents, 53 cents, 81 cents, 81 cents, 60 cents. And all that does is helps widen the credit that we took in on the total position overall. And when we take in a really big credit, massive credit that helps widen our break even points out on either end. I hope you could wish you could see me here recording this podcast because I got my hands like stretched all the way out that our credit just gets so big that we continuously take in that it widens the break even points out to the point at which they're now well beyond, you know, what they were originally. So we've got this wide position, this wide strangle that we're starting to build in EWZ. Now we got to March expiration, and again, we've got to make a decision. What do we do at March expiration? And what we decided to do, because it worked out pricing-wise, was to roll all of the contracts out to the next expiration cycle, which is April. So we went ahead and we used a couple calendar spread orders, which is just very simple ways to roll a single contract out to the next expiration cycle. And we did that, and we rolled the entire position that we had from March out to the April expiration cycle. Remember, we did not at this point close out of our short 21 calls uh, or our short 24 calls. We didn't move those up. We still maintain those out in the next expiration cycle. And as we rolled the contracts out to the next expiration cycle, giving us more time to hopefully see EWZ come back around, we continue to take in a credit. So in the case of rolling out our call strikes, we took in a 70 cent credit because we're just giving ourselves more time. Uh, In some of the put strikes, we got 40 cents and 40 cents and 65 cents. So we continue to roll this thing out over time to, again, build a credit, build a massive credit in this position and give ourselves more time. So now we're into the April expiration cycle. Now during this time period, still implied volatility has not gone down. And during the April or the, I'm sorry, the April expiration cycle, yeah, the April expiration cycle, implied volatility actually spiked up to around the hundredth percentile and level, which means that I've been as high as it was in the last year. This was the highest point that it had ever been. And so what that meant is that option premium was so inflated, so big that our position was now starting to grow in size and again, grow in loss as the stock 
continue to rally and as volatility continued to rally. Now, as we went closer to April expiration, the stock actually rallied all the way up to $30 per share. Now, some of you right now are probably listening to this podcast and you're like rolling your eyes like, oh my God, I would have never kept this position. But again, we had our initial position size small and we kept taking in this credit. So we knew that at some point, if we held on to this position and let the market kind of cyclicality play out, we knew that it was going to come down at some point. We just had to hold on to this position. Again, we may not have done this necessarily with a stock per se, but we definitely felt we could do it with an ETF. All right, so now here we are at the end of April expiration. The stock has basically gone from 20 up to 30 in about a month and a half, and we still have all of these strangles and kind of loose positions on all these adjustments. What do we end up doing at the end of April expiration? Now, at the end of April expiration, like I said, implied volatility was the highest level that it had been in the year. So naturally, what do you do when implied volatility is that high? You roll your contracts to the next expiration period. Now, this is what was really cool is that this is what I don't think a lot of people did. And believe me, I got so many emails from members like, why are we rolling to April or why are we rolling to the May expiration period? And what I kept trying to tell people is that, listen, you're now rolling from low volatility to higher, highest volatility. So we're going to get compensated even more than we did before when we rolled from March to April. Rolling from April to May, we took in a huge credit across the board because we were rolling into the highest implied volatility that could possibly or that was seen in the last year. So just for you guys listening on the show, obviously you can see this on the show notes page. When we started rolling with these calendars from April to May, instead of collecting 40 cents and 60 cents like we did going from March to April, we started collecting $112.00. $113, $111. We started collecting premiums that were double what we collected last time that we rolled. And so again, every time that we collect a dollar in premium, that moves our break-even points out another dollar. And so if we started collecting all of these additional dollars, it just keeps moving our break-even points further and further and further out, okay? Now, at this point, what we ended up doing also is we ended up rolling out our calls again. So we continue to roll out our calls. We never touched the call strikes. We still had some 21 calls and some 24 calls. We rolled those out and again, still collected some credit to do that. So throughout this entire process, we're never touching that side of the trade that's moving against us. Even though it's now $6 in the money, $7 in the money in some cases, we're not touching that side of the trade. We just keep collecting these credits further and further out. Now, as we got into and through the April expiration cycle and we started working our way into the May expiration cycle, what we saw right after the April expiration was implied volatility drop from basically about 90 down to around 50. So implied volatility was cut in half during this time period. And that was really, really welcome because what that did is that finally allowed all this premium that we had been collecting to finally collapse, which helped eat away at the loss that we had at seemingly overnight. I mean, like overnight, we were holding, you know, originally a $2,500 loss. And then as soon as that implied volatility dropped, the stock didn't even go anywhere. Stock really stayed the same. But that drop in implied volatility that got cut in half basically knocked most of the position down. And so what we saw was that $2,500 loss come down considerably. I think it came down to like the first day around $600. I mean, this is one day and a huge, huge move in our position. Again, because we were able to roll and extend duration and timeline and waited for that drop to happen because we know it can't be sustained forever. And so what we ended up doing is ultimately we ended up holding the position a little bit longer into May expiration. And on 5.18, uh, we ended up closing out the entire position and kind of buying everything back before the May expiration cycle. Now, during this time period, on 519, we also saw the stock come back down from around $30 back down to just above 26. So on five, I'm sorry, 518, I keep saying 519. So on 518, we closed out of everything, basically liquidated the rest of the position, all of the contracts, all of the in the money strikes, everything that we had. And that was after the stock came back down from 30 down to 26. Now, this was really good because we had hauled on to this position knowing that two things were going to happen. And look, I, I can't tell you guys enough and you guys can go back into my video archives and listen to me say this as we're actually in the middle of the trade, because it's so easy for me to say this now and say, oh, retroactively, I knew that the stock was going to come down. I knew volatility was going to come down. Very easy for somebody to say this, you know, kind of after the fact, you know, 
hindsight's 2020. But I had said this numerous times before in video updates as we were in the middle of seeing the stock run up to 30 and imply volatility go to the 100th rank. I knew then because I'd just been trading for a long time that this stuff always normalizes. And so again, on 518, we were able to see the stock come back down from 30 to just over 26. And that helped us close out the entire position. And at the end of the day, after all the credits, all the stuff that we did, the rolls and everything, we ended up just losing $330 on the position. So it still wasn't profitable. I'm not saying it was. We would have loved to see the stock come back down even further. But during that time period, we were able to cut the loss on this thing by 87% because of keeping our duration long, meaning extending the trade, waiting for the market to normalize, and continuously taking in a credit by adjustments. And that's rolling up our puts and then rolling the entire strategy out from month to month to month. Okay, so hopefully this has been a really cool, really eye-opening case study for you. Again, I've been wanting to do this for a long time and just had the time to go down here, you know, write everything down and kind of outline it here. Again, you can see a video version of this when we actually close out the position and send out the uh, update to our members. Uh, we go through the same stuff on the video update to our members. That's now publicly live and available. So really great case study for you guys to look at. Uh, you can get everything by going to the show notes page at optionalpha.com slash show 59. And of course, if you guys have questions about this and want to know more about adjustment techniques or strategies, please head on over to optionalpha.com slash ask and leave me a voicemail there. And um, we're definitely going to start asking or answering some more of these questions on the podcast here in the next month or so. And so we're building up a nice bank of questions that people have. Uh, I'd love to get your take on this. If you think this was really helpful to kind of go over this, I think that this is something that's not talked about enough in this industry. And so hopefully this is a really, really good kind of example and walk through the thought process and logic basically from start to finish when we you know, had this position for the last five months. So let's get into the closing bell though. And let's actually talk about an adjustment that we're making to a current position that we have in GDX. Now, the closing bell. Find out which stocks we're looking at right now, trades we're making, and hear our game plan moving forward. Moving forward. All right, so I want to talk about in this closing bell segment and adjustment trade because I think it's important to kind of piggyback what we talked about in this adjustment case study video here with EWZ and that's making these adjustments as stocks are moving against us. Now we have a position that's still remaining in GDX. We've actually traded GDX and silver really, really well this year. Actually, they're definitely our most profitable two symbols that we've traded. But the one position that we have in GDX is going a little bit against us as gold at the moment continues to rally a little bit higher. So it's gone from about $27 up to about $30, uh, which isn't a big move, but for GDX, that's a, a pretty decent move and it's kind of started to move against our position. So what we ended up doing here with GDX, because we originally had a strangle on, is we ended up, excuse me, rolling up our puts from the 28 put up to the 30 strike put. So right now, at the time that we're doing this video, GDX is trading around $30 and some change. And so what we're doing is we're rolling that put from 28, which is a little bit further out now, and we're rolling it up to the 30 strike. Now we can buy back that 28 put for a profit. We buy that back for $20, we're selling the 30 strike put for $63. That means we're taking in a net credit of $43. And what that does is that helps widen our break even point by another 43 cents on either end. So again, it's this continuous concept and we're just practicing what we preach here by adjusting this trade, rolling up the side that the market is moving away from and taking in a credit. Now we're getting closer to August expiration. That's the time that we're doing this video. Um, August expiration at this moment in time right now is about 16 days away. So, so we're definitely getting close to August expiration. We're not there yet where we would be rolling the contracts to next month. But what we've already seen in EW and uh, GDX is we've already seen that implied volatility drop. And that's where we made most of our money in GDX uh, over the last month or so is seeing implied volatility drop from around 70 down to around 20. So we've absolutely seen implied volatility get crushed and we've made some money. We just have a couple lingering positions now that we have to kind of manage. Uh, and again, it's very similar to what happened in EWZ. We had EWZ, we saw volatility contract, and then we just had to wait a little bit for kind of price action to be where we wanted. And I think EW, uh, GDX is going to be in that range too, where we're going to see GDX maybe come down just a little bit. It's definitely on a little bit of a run. 
We know that the markets are are neutral and efficient, and we're going to see this come down at some point. And so making this adjustment just helps, you know, kind of keep our position and risk in check by rolling up our put strike. So hopefully that's another a good example of how we're doing it in another security. Again, we're, we usually do this a lot with some of the ETFs that we trade uh, because we just know that we can hold on to those positions a little bit longer. So hopefully this was a good little closing bell segment to kind of piggyback on what we had talked about in the EWZ position. As always, if you guys have questions, please let us know. Head on over to the show notes page at optionalpha.com slash show 59. Again, that's just the number 59, optionalpha.com slash show 59. Thanks for listening to the Option Alpha podcast. If you liked what you heard, please drop by iTunes and leave a rating or comment. Plus, you can get everything. Free email updates for future shows, transcripts, video tutorials, case studies, and more. Just visit our website at optionalpha.com. All right, so I hope you got a lot out of this show today going over this case study with EWZ. The one thing that I'll ask is that if you could take just two minutes and either write a review for the show, that helps definitely get the word out in what we're trying to do here at Option Alpha, or take this show and send it to one of your trading friends or buddies or post it in a group because I think it's a really great case study. I know it went a little bit long here today, but I think it's a really cool case study that maybe other people need to hear. And again, if I have to be the guinea pig that talks about a losing trade on a podcast, but that maybe helps somebody else learn how to make an adjustment by themselves, uh, I think that that's really worth it. So I would encourage you to share it with just at least one person out there and help spread the word about what we're trying to do here at Option Alpha. And of course, if you liked today's show and want to get all of the information, see the screenshots and videos, please head on over to the show notes page at optionalpha.com slash show 59. Again, that's optionalpha.com slash show 59. Until next time, happy trading.